You're listening to a special presentation of the Hour of the Time. I'm William Cooper. At 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, on the evening of October 30th, 1938, the night before All Saints Day, now generally celebrated as Halloween, an estimated 6 million Americans listened to the famous Orson Welles broadcast, War of the Worlds, describing an invasion from Mars. An estimated one million people responded with sustained credulity and fear. Thousands responded with sheer panic. Some committed suicide. And in the small village of Grover's Mill, New Jersey, residents left their homes and shot holes in their city water tower, thinking that it was a Martian tripod invasion machine. The broadcast, ladies and gentlemen, was a psychological warfare experiment conducted by the Princeton Radio Project. The Rockefeller Foundation funded the project in the fall of 1937. An office of radio research was set up with Paul F. Lazarsfeld as director and Frank Stanton and Hanley Crentrill as associate directors. Cantrell used a special grant from the General Education Board to study the effects of the broadcast. Cantrell published the study as a book titled The Invasion from Mars, A Study in the Psychology of Panic. It contains a complete script of the broadcast. The book is one of a series of studies sponsored by the Federal Radio Education Committee. War of the Worlds, ladies and gentlemen, was broadcast by Mercury Theater on the air from a microphone in a New York studio of the Columbia Broadcasting System. Council on Foreign Relations member Frank Stanton was a CBS executive. Stanton would direct Radio Free Europe in later years. Regarding the program's realism, Cantrill writes, The sheer dramatic excellence of the broadcast must not be overlooked. The unusual realism of the performance may be attributed to the fact that the early parts of the broadcast fell within the existing standards of judgment of the listeners. A few short weeks before this broadcast, millions of listeners had kept their radios tuned for the latest news from a Europe apparently about to go to war. They had learned to expect that musical programs, dramas, Broadcasts of all kinds would be cut off in a serious emergency to inform or warn an eager and anxious public. A large proportion of listeners, particularly those in the lower income and educational brackets, have grown to rely more on the radio than on the newspapers for news. On this particular night, when the listener tuned to the Mercury Theater, he heard the music of Ramon Raquello and his orchestra, coming from the Meridian Room in the Park Plaza Hotel of New York City. Soon after the first piece had begun, an announcer broke in. Ladies and gentlemen, we interrupt our program of dance music to bring you a special bulletin from the Intercontinental Radio News. This report brought the story of the first explosion on Mars. The music was resumed only to be followed by another break. Ladies and gentlemen, following on the news given in our bulletin a moment ago, the Government Meteorological Bureau has requested the large observatories of the country to keep an astronomical watch. This bulletin contains the information that a huge flaming object, believed to be a meteorite, 
felony farm in the neighborhood of Grover's Mill, New Jersey. The swing band gets in 20 seconds more, and then the invasion continues uninterruptedly. The last announcement comes from New York City, and the announcer says, I'm speaking from the roof of Broadcasting Building, New York City. The bells you hear are ringing to warn the people to evacuate the city as the Martians approach. Estimated in last two hours, three million people have moved out along the roads to the north. Hutchison River Parkway still kept open for motor traffic. Avoid bridges to Long Island. Hopelessly jammed. All communication with Jersey Shore closed ten minutes ago. No more defenses. Our army wiped out. Artillery, Air Force, everything wiped out. This May, the last broadcast, will stay here to the end. People are holding service below us in the cathedral. And in the background, ladies and gentlemen, you could hear voices singing hymns. Now I look down the harbor. All manner of boats overloaded with fleeing population, pulling out from docks. Then you could hear the sound of boat whistles. Streets are all jammed. Noise and crowds like New Year's Eve in city. Wait a minute. Enemy now inside above the Palisades. Five great machines. First one is crossing the river. I can see it from here, wading the Hudson like a man, wading through a brook. A bulletin's handed to me. Martian cylinders are falling all over the country. One outside Buffalo. One in Chicago. St. Louis. Seem to be timed and spaced. Now the first machine reaches the shore. He stands, watching, looking over the city. His steel, cowlish head is even with the skyscrapers. He waits for the others. They rise like a line of new towers on the city's west side. Now, now they're lifting their metal hands. This is the end now. Smoke comes out. Black smoke drifting over the city. People in the streets see it now. They're running towards the East River. Thousands of them dropping in like rats. Now the smoke's spreading faster. It's reached Times Square. People trying to run away from it, but it's no use. They're falling like flies. Now the smoke's crossing 6th Avenue, 5th Avenue, 100 yards away. It's, it's 50 feet. The announcer breaks off. And a field artillery radio operator is heard. 2X, 2L, calling CQ. 2X, 2L, calling CQ. 2X, 2L, calling CQ. New York. Isn't there anyone on the air? Isn't there anyone? 2X, 2L. And then, that's the middle break of the broadcast. The double Roman numeral X, which stands for the number 20, X times 2, are 2X, ladies and gentlemen, are espionage code names for a double cross. The fictitious call letters can be interpreted by insiders in the intelligence community to mean double cross to hell. 2X, 2L, double cross to hell. Hadley Cantrill was born in Hiram, Utah on the 16th of June in 1906. He graduated Dartmouth College with a Bachelor of Science in Psychology in 1928. He studied in Munich and Berlin, 1929 to 1930. He received a Ph.D. in psychology from Harvard in 1931. In 1949, Cantrill received an LLD, a doctorate in law, from Washington and Lee University. Cantrill taught sociology at Dartmouth College from 1931 to 1932, and psychology at Harvard from 1932 to 1935, and Columbia University 1935 to 36. In 1936, ladies and gentlemen, Cantrill joined the Princeton Psychology Department. He remained a member of the department until his death in 1969. In 1950, Cantrill authored a book called Tensions That Cause Wars. Copyright 1950. 
1935, George Gallup of Gallup Poll fame, Elmer Roper, and Archibald Crosley were studying opinion polling as a tool to help social scientists and psychologists learn about people's likes and dislikes. Gallup's and Roper's surveys appeared in Fortune magazine. After the war, Harry Truman would choose the director of Fortune magazine, Council on Foreign Relations member John Kenneth Galbraith, to direct European economic security policy. Roper would become deputy director for the Office of Strategic Services, known as the OSS, the precursor to the Central Intelligence Agency. The OSS Psychological Warfare Division staff included Council on Foreign Relations members Douglas Cater of the Aspen Institute, W. Phillips, Phillips Davison of the Rand and Columbia think tanks, William Langer of Stanford University, and William S. Paley, who was the head of Columbia Broadcasting System, known to you as CBS. Gallup's, Roper's, and Crosley's work interested people in government, aspiring politicians, and market researchers. Gallup, Roper, and Crosley were not members of the academic fraternity. Established social scientists belittled their work. However, the studies interested Cantrill. One of Cantrill's earliest articles, The Social Psychology of Everyday Life, 1934, contained a plea for social psychologists to devote more attention to devising new techniques to study ongoing problems. Lester Markell, Sunday editor of the New York Times, asked Cantrill to write some articles about scientific polling in connection with the presidential campaign of 1936. Well, folks, Cantrell went to Princeton to talk with George Gallup. Gallup was flattered and offered Cantrill the use of his facilities at Princeton to conduct the research. In 1936, Cantrill and DeWitt Poole founded a quarterly publication called Public Opinion Quarterly. Harwood Childs was editor. Cantrill was associate editor. Poole was a State Department expert in anti-communist propaganda. Poole became chief of the Foreign Nationalities Branch of the Office of Strategic Services. Poole directed OSS efforts to recruit agents from immigrant communities. The agents spied on their neighbors and analyzed foreign language publications. The Public Opinion Quarterly Board of Editors included veteran psychological warfare experts Harold Laswell, Paul Lazarsfield, and Frank Stanton. I believe that's Paul Lazarsfeld and Frank Stanton. DeWitt Poole would become president of the National Committee for a Free Europe, one of the CIA's largest single propaganda efforts. Council on Foreign Relations member Stanton directed the Free Europe Fund a central intelligence agency proprietary corporation that laundered the money for Poole's National Committee psychopolitical operations. Today, ladies and gentlemen, the Advisory Committee on Communication at Columbia University sponsors and publishes the quarterly, the organ of Columbia University's American Association for Public Opinion Research. In 1984, CFR member Frederick T.C.U., was on the Advisory Committee on Communication, and CFR member Daniel Yankelevich was on the editorial board of the Public Opinion Quarterly. The American Association for Public Opinion Research was founded in 1947. Its address is a post office box in Ann Arbor, Michigan. In 1993, the organization had 1,450 members and an annual budget of $170,000. It consists of six regional groups. Its members are described as individuals interested in the methods and applications of public opinion and social research. It still publishes the Public Opinion Quarterly. Cantrills published his research on Gallup's techniques in early issues of the Public Opinion Quarterly. The articles described how to better understand why people of various backgrounds, interests, loyalties, and information levels held certain opinions, and how to use this information 
to effectively gear research concerned with psychological and political dynamics of people into United States government operation to achieve policy aims. In effect, ladies and gentlemen, how to manipulate people to get them to do what you want them to do. In 1940, the Rockefeller Foundation funded Ken Trill's establishment of the Office of Public Opinion Research. It was housed in the attic of Princeton University's Palmer Physics Building. Its purposes were, one, to learn and study public opinion techniques systematically. Two, to gain insights into the psychological aspects of public opinion, how and why it changes, what motivates large segments of the public. Three, to build up an archive of public opinion data for the use of qualified scholars, and four, to begin to follow the course of American public opinion during the war that had already started in Europe. The Office of Public Opinion Research also analyzed the effectiveness of Office of Strategic Service psychopolitical operations. OSS Deputy Director Elmer Roper established a similar research center at Williams College. Dr. Philip K. Hastings, one of Cantrill's former students, directed the Roper Center. The Roper Center received all of the Office of Public Opinion Research Center's files to help them get started. Now, Cantrill coined a term for this work. He called it policy research. Cantrill tells us, Most relevant to the story of policy research are the efforts begun in 1940 by the Office of Public Opinion Research to utilize and adapt survey methods as the European war progressed and the United States became increasingly involved. This research dealt with three kinds of problems. One, devising questions that would help us to understand more clearly what the American people felt the United States should do vis-a-vis -vis the war in Europe and what differences of opinion there were in various population groups. Two, formulating trend questions that could be repeated, either at regular intervals or as events dictated, and three, testing the reliability of small samples. During 1940 and 1941, the Office of Public Opinion Research obtained all data through the American Institute of Public Opinion at cost. On September the 12th, 1939, the Council on Foreign Relations began to take control of the Department of State. On that day, Hamilton Fish Armstrong, Editor of Foreign Affairs, and Walter H. Mallory, Executive Director of the Council on Foreign Relations, paid a visit to the State Department. The Council proposed forming groups of experts to proceed with research in the general areas of security, armament, economic, political, and territorial problems. The State Department accepted the proposal. The project, 1939-1945, to was called Council on Foreign Relations War and Peace Studies. Hamilton Fish Armstrong was Executive Director. In February 1941, the CFR officially became part of the State Department. The Department of State established the Division of Special Research. It was organized just like the Council on Foreign Relations War and Peace Studies Project. It was divided into economic, political, territorial, and security sections. The research secretaries serving with the council groups were hired by the State Department to work in this new division. These men also were permitted to continue serving as research secretaries to their respective council groups. Leo Pazwalski was appointed director of research. In 1942, the relationship between the Department of State and the Council on Foreign Relations strengthened again. The department organized an advisory committee on post-war foreign policies. The chairman was Secretary Cordell Hall the Vice Chairman, Under Secretary Sumner Wells. Dr. Leo Pazwalski, Director of the Division of Special Research, was appointed Executive Officer. Several experts were brought in from outside the department. 
The outside experts were Council on Foreign Relations, War and Peace Studies members, Hamilton Fish Armstrong, Isaiah Bowman, Benjamin V. Cohen, Norman H. Davis, and James T. Shotwell. In total, ladies and gentlemen, there were 362 meetings of the War and Peace Studies Group. The meetings were held at Council on Foreign Relations Headquarters, the Harold Pratt House, 58 East 68th Street, New York City. The Council's wartime work was confidential. The Pratt House, the Harold Pratt House. The name Pratt is found in use as a byname in 11th century England. Pratt, ladies and gentlemen, was the English nickname for a cunning trickster. Pratt comes from the Old English word proet, meaning trick. Pratt is the family name of the Marquesses and Earls Camden. They are descended from John Pratt, died in 1573, of Devonshire. The first Earl, Sir Charles Pratt, 1714 to 1794, was a childhood friend of William Pitt, 1708 to 1778, the first Earl of Chatham. Remember that, Chatham. England's Royal Institute of International Affairs headquarters is Chatham House, located at 10 St. James Square in London. In June of 1940, William Stevenson of British Intelligence was setting up the British Security Coordination Group in the United States. Franklin Delano Roosevelt was preparing to send an unofficial observer to London. The president selected a man he had known for more than 30 years. His name was William J. Donovan. Stevenson's mission included influencing high-ranking government officials to bring the United States into the war. Joseph P. Kennedy was the United States ambassador in London. Kennedy had been advising the president against American involvement in the war. William Stevenson was pleased when the president's choice was Donovan for the mission. Donovan attended Columbia Law School with Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Donovan was a World War I Medal of Honor winner. In 1929, Donovan was a Wall Street lawyer. In 1935, Donovan went to Rome, Egypt, and Ethiopia for the War Department to observe the Italian campaign against Ethiopia. In 1937, Donovan attended maneuvers of the German Army and inspected their tanks and artillery. In 1938, Donovan toured Czechoslovakia, the Balkans, and Italy and visited the battlefields of the Spanish Civil War. Ladies and gentlemen, William Dave J. Donovan was a member of the Knights Templar. In 1941, a new agency was created, the Office of Coordinator of Information. Donovan ran it. The agency pooled information gathered by all the intelligence services and used the information for psychological warfare purposes. The talents of psychoanalysis across the country were mobilized to study domestic morale and psychological warfare techniques on morale. The study was released as a top secret psychological report in 1943. It included a study of Adolf Hitler and his influence on the German people. The psychologist leading the study was Dr. Walter Langer, Walter's brother William helped to evaluate Hitler. CFR member William L. Langer was OSS branch chief for research and analysis. He worked with CFR member William H. Jackson. Their OSS research included indirect assessment, indirect assessment, ladies and gentlemen, was a way of evaluating a man's personality or state of mind without direct interview by a psychologist. William Langer used the technique to produce a psychological profile of Hitler as part of Donovan's top-secret OSS study. William L. Langer was a key figure in the intelligence community. William Langer, Alan W. Dulles, 
and Arthur Sweetster were members of the Council on Foreign Relations. They were specifically members of the Peace and Aims Group. Arthur Sweetster became the Deputy Director of the Office of War Information. Sweetser and Langer also worked together as members of the political group with John Foster Dulles, Allen's brother. General Donovan and Allen Dulles made a career of trying to have the Director of Central Intelligence assigned to the office of the President. Now, in his early career, William Langer was a fellow at the Center for Advanced Study in Behavioral Sciences at Stanford. In World War I, Langer rose from private to sergeant and participated in the St. Mihiel and Argonne engagements. Langer's first significant book was The Diplomacy of Imperialism, 1935. Langer was a member of the Board of Analysts, Office of Coordinator of Information from 1941 to 1942. Chief of OSS Research and Analysis Branch, 1942 to 1945. Special Assistant for Intelligence Analysis to the Secretary of State, 1946, and Assistant Director of the Central Intelligence Agency, 1950 to 1952. After 1952, Langer served as a consultant to the Central Intelligence Agency. In his presidential address to the American Historical Association in 1957, Langer emphasized the need for deeper study and more extensive reference by historians to the teachings of modern psychology. William L. Langer was one of ten editorial sponsors of the American edition of Mein Kampf, written in 1939. His view was that Hitler's Mein Kampf was an extraordinary medley of amateur politics and amazing insights into international problems and possibilities and that Hitler showed reckless courage in realizing the German dreams, nightmarish as some of them were. In Schuster was another Mein Kampf editorial sponsor. Like Langer, Schuster was a Council on Foreign Relations, Peace, and Aims Group member. Schuster also was a journalist. He served in France as a sergeant in Army Intelligence in World War I. After the war, he was in the Army of Occupation in Germany. Schuster admired the German culture and sympathized with Germany's economic problems. In his book, The Germans, 1932, he glibly dismissed the ideas of Adolf Hitler as no more commendable for wisdom or practicableness than are the notions of the average United States senator. Schuster's views towards Hitler changed. In 1934, Schuster denounced the Nazis' assaults on individual and religious freedom. During World War II, Schuster served on the Enemy Alien Board. When the war began, Secretary of War Henry Stimson ordered an evacuation of all Japanese, alien and American alike, from the coastal regions of California. CFR member Stimson remarked that the evacuation made an awful hole in the Constitution, but he had to do it on the grounds of safety of the nation and out of military necessity. The Japanese, alien and American alike, were rationalized into concentration camps. Stimson didn't rationalize Germans, alien and American alike, into concentration camps. Did the Japanese-American evacuation recommendation come from the Enemy Alien Board? Mein Kampf's editorial preface warns, Mein Kampf is a propagandistic essay by a violent partisan. As such, it often warps historical truth and sometimes ignores it completely. We have therefore felt it our duty to accompany the text with factual information which constitutes an extensive critique of the original. No American would like to assume responsibility for giving the public a text which, if not tested in the light of diligent inquiry, might convey the impression that Hitler was writing history rather than propaganda. 
Mein Kampf's editorial introduction informs us historical truth was ignored completely for over 14 years. Quote, Until now, the only version of Mein Kampf in English has been a condensation of the complete book published in 1933 under the title My Battle, prepared by E.T.S. Dugdale in England, containing less than half the total text. There are undoubtedly passages of great importance which now appear in English for the first time. For example, chapter 5 of the condensed version left out the whole of what Hitler describes as his wartime reflections on propaganda and the methods for fighting Marxism. We have marked at various points in the text the important new material. Furthermore, any abridgment must necessarily fail in proportion to the degree of its condensation. To give the full flavor of the author's mind, even the repetitions have their significance in conveying a sense of the character behind them. Mein Kampf is, above all, a book of feeling. The translation here offered is from the first German edition, the two volumes respectively of 1925 and 1927, which are now quite difficult to obtain." End quote. The National Socialist German Workers' Party was founded on November 9, 1919. Hitler writes in the conclusion to Mein Kampf, On November 9, 1923, in the fourth year of its existence, the National Socialist German Workers' Party was dissolved and forbidden throughout the entire territory of the Reich. Today, in November of 1926, it stands again before us free through the whole Reich, stronger and internally more stable than ever before. The German people recognized the evil of Hitler and tried to do something about it. But it didn't work. Were World War I British and American intelligence agents left in Germany as part of an Institute of International Affairs plan to cause a second world war? Did CFR intelligence agents help bring Hitler to power to create an enemy the American people could hate, loathe, and fight? Were CFR members Schuster, who wrote about Hitler in 1932, and Langer, who worked on a psychological profile of Hitler, and CFR insider Hadley Cantrell, who studied in Munich and Berlin from 1929 to 1930, three of those intelligence agents. Mein Kampf was published in 1925. Why wasn't a translation made available to the English-speaking people until 1939, and then contained only half the original text? Was this information withheld for 14 years so the Germans wouldn't receive support from other nations and Hitler could take power? Why weren't covert operations carried out to prevent Hitler's rise to power? Did the Office of Strategic Services put up funds for getting Mein Kampf translated, published, and marketed in the United States? Was Mein Kampf released in 1939 to help set the stage for ensuring America's entry into the war? Dumbarton Oaks in Georgetown is famous for being the site of the 1944 conference that led to the establishment of the United Nations. Present at the Dumbarton Oaks conference were many members of the Council on Foreign Relations, War, and Peace Studies. Among those who had leading roles on many of the committees and commissions were George N. Schuster, William L. Langer, Arthur Sweetser, Hamilton Fish Armstrong, John Foster Dulles, Grayson Kirk, Dwight E. Lee, Isaiah Bowman, David N. Rowe, Winfield W. Riefler, Carter Goodrich, Calvin B. Hoover, Owen Lattimore, and Frank R. McCoy. Now, folks, many of these men attended the conference as members of our advisors to the State Department. Forty-nine days later, the Council on Foreign Relations, Institutes of International Affairs, and Institutes of Pacific Relations achieved the aim they failed to achieve a quarter of a century before. At noon on 9th of October, 1944, the text of the proposals 
the United States, United Kingdom, Soviet Union, and China agreed upon were issued simultaneously in Washington, London, Moscow, and Chongqing. The machinery to create one world government became a reality. Instead of being called the League of Nations, the organization was called the United Nations. This time, the American people weren't given the chance to say no. Today, American soldiers are part of a worldwide police force, forced to fight in times of peace, wearing non-American uniforms under the command of foreign officers. Their commander-in-chief is a draft-dodging, adulterous Council on Foreign Relations member who is a chronic liar and is about to sell United States nuclear technology to Communist China's president. Institute of Pacific Relations member Jiang Zemin, the butcher of Beijing, while keeping America in a state of perpetual national security due to the threat of nuclear terrorism. Now, sometime in 1942, the Office of Coordinator of Information was reorganized into two independent agencies, the Office of Strategic Services and the Office of War Information, known as OWI. William Donovan became the head of the newly created Office of Strategic Services. William Stevenson was head of the British intelligence counterpart. The psychological warfare study was moved into the domain of the Office of War Information. In a book entitled Unwritten Treaty, James P. Warburg writes, This book is dedicated to the men and women of OWI who served at home and abroad on the far-flung psychological battlefronts of World War II and whose skill and devotion created the voice of America. Warburg explains, Psychological warfare against a declared or undeclared enemy is probably as old as human history. It consists of two basic elements, the threat or appeal to fear and the bribe or appeal to greed. When the earliest savage raised his fist against a neighbor, he was using the psychological weapon of the threat. When he baited a trap, he was exploiting the appeal to greed. Bluff, bribery, and deception have played a part in every human struggle throughout history. But it remained for our generation to develop psychological warfare as a means of systematic nationalistic aggression. Psychological warfare aims at the undermining of a people's confidence in its cause its strength, its leaders, and itself, and at the destruction of its determination to fight for its cause or even for its life. This combination of confidence and determination we call morale. When a nation's morale is destroyed, it commits suicide, as did Austria, or else it submits to conquest after feeble and disorganized resistance, as did France. In any case, it reaches a state of mind in which resistance seems hopeless and surrender less of an evil than endurance of armed conflict. Psychological warfare against an enemy nation seeks to paralyze the will of that nation by spreading confusion, by alternating excessive hope and excessive fear, by exploiting every cleavage and adding fuel to every prejudice, its chief weapon is propaganda. That is the dissemination of ideas. But propaganda, to be effective, must be based upon full and carefully analyzed intelligence concerning the enemy, and must be coordinated with espionage, fifth column activity, and actual sabotage. All these assignments are carried out by the implantation of carefully selected ideas and concepts. These ideas and concepts are neither necessarily true nor necessarily false. In fact, whether they are true or false makes no difference whatsoever so long as they successfully serve to create the desired state of mind. It follows that there is no validity whatsoever to the widely held belief 
that propaganda consists by definition of spreading of lies. Truth and falsehood make no difference in themselves. There is equally little justification for the belief that the propaganda of decent democratic nations should be the truth and nothing but the truth. It cannot be stated with sufficient emphasis that information is one thing, propaganda quite another. The purpose of spreading information is to promote the functioning of man's reason. The purpose of propaganda is to mobilize certain of man's emotions in such a way that they will dominate his reason. The function of an information agency is to disseminate truth to a make available fact and opinion, each carefully labeled and separated from the other. The aim of an information agency is to enable as many people as possible to form their own individual judgments on the basis of relevant fact and authoritative opinion. The function of a propaganda agency is almost the exact opposite. It is not to inform, but to persuade. In order to persuade, it must disseminate only such fact, such opinion, and such fiction masquerading as fact as will serve to make people act or fail to act in the desired way. The Office of Coordinator of Information and the Office of War Information weren't information agencies, they were propaganda agencies. The Office of War Information extended contracts for communications research to Paul Lazarsfeld, Hadley Cantrill, the Council on Foreign Relations member Frank Stanton, the famous Orson Welles' War of the Worlds was an experiment in psychological warfare. The American public became unwitting subjects in an experiment to study mass behavior to try to determine the factors of personality, experience, and circumstance that made for various degrees of suggestibility under the impact of fear. Fear. The experiment in terror was planned, coordinated, and carried out by Council on Foreign Relations members and insiders. Isn't an experiment of this nature immoral and illegal? And if they were doing that then, what, pray tell, are they doing now? Adolf Hitler and his propaganda minister, Joseph Goebbels, warped history by ignoring it completely and stressing favorable and unfavorable truths to cause tension and hate between different groups of people. Goebbels' work fascinated CFR member Edward R. Murrow. The Rockefeller Foundation funded Murrow to perform a systematic analysis of Nazi radio propaganda techniques and the political use of radio. Murrow, with help from Cantrill and Lloyd Free, began the project at Princeton in 1940. The Princeton Listening Center was set up in an old house on Alexander Street belonging to Princeton's Institute of Advanced Study, known as the IASP. IASP was a reasonable copy of the Royal Institute of International Affairs Chief Oxford Headquarters, All Souls College. CFR member Abraham Flexner of Rockefeller's General Education Board and Foundation Administrator organized it from plans drawn by Tom Jones, one of the Royal Institute of International Affairs' most active intriguers and Foundation's administrators. This project resulted in a worldwide monitoring and broadcasting government agency called the Foreign Broadcast Intelligence Service, known as FBIS. FBIS was a psychological warfare machine. FBIS became the United States Information Agency, or USIA. The USIA was established to achieve United States foreign policy by influencing public attitude at home and abroad using psychopolitical policy strategies. The USIA Office of Research and Reference Service 
prepares data on psychological factors and propaganda problems considered by the Policy Planning Board in formulating psychopolitical information policies for the National Security Council. Edward R. Murrow would subsequently be named head of the USIA. Murrow became the propaganda minister for the United States. In effect, America's Joseph Goebbels. Was Hitler's rise to power a psychopolitical operation planned and coordinated by members of the Council on Foreign Relations, Institutes of International Affairs, and Institutes of Pacific Relations? Was Hitler's rise to power another double cross to hell? 2X, 2L. Another Council on Foreign Relations experiment in fear? And if it was, and ladies and gentlemen, I know absolutely that it was, for they needed a terrible world war to propel the world into a world government under a United Nations. And isn't that treason? People's actions, ladies and gentlemen, even yours, are strongly influenced by their knowledge base. You see, people act upon their beliefs, not facts, but upon their beliefs. You see, you can manipulate a person's actions by corrupting their knowledge base, by warping historical truth or ignoring it completely. Knowledge can make for independence if it helps people meet their world more confidently and realistically, but that can only happen when people are dealing with facts and with the truth. Those who have wanted others to remain dependent have always recognized this fact and have opposed the spread of knowledge. They include those who felt the Bible must not be read by the people, those who made laws against teaching slaves to read and write, and those who kept the plans of a monster like Hitler a secret for more than 14 years. Don't you think it's time to investigate the Council on Foreign Relations, the Institutes of International Affairs, and the Institutes of Pacific Relations? And yes, even Art Bell, you see, the alien threat is presented through the use of secret technology originally developed by the Germans in their secret weapons programs during World War II by geniuses like Nikola Tesla and many others. Most military and government personnel who have access to this material believe the threat is real. None of them, not even one, however, has ever seen any evidence of the existence of any extraterrestrial creature or any advanced technology other than that of human origin. It is extremely difficult, if not almost impossible, to believe that top-secret documentation could be lies. I know. I had one of the highest security clearances that can be held by anyone and I had access to all of this information, and what I am telling you is the truth. It is trust in government by good men and women who have given their lives in its service that keeps the real secret from the public eye. And the real secret is that there are no extraterrestrials, ladies and gentlemen. There is, absolutely is, a lot of advanced technology mind control projects, and psychological operations. All so-called leaks are intentional misinformation projects designed to promote the alien threat scenario while allowing for complete deniability on the part of the government. The antics of Vicki Cooper Ecker, who is a CIA operative, Donald Francis Ecker III, who is just a dupe. William Moore and Jamie Chanderay, Stanton T. Friedman, Bruce McAbee, who works for the Central Intelligence Agency and the Office of Naval Intelligence, Barry Taff, who is a neuropsychiatric institute of the University of California in Los Angeles, and he works with Dr. Jolyon West, Whitley Strieber, 
Bud Hopkins, who is a member of the Central Intelligence Agency. John Lear, who is a member of the Central Intelligence Agency. Linda Moulton Howe, who is a member of the Order of the Eastern Star. Art Bell, who is admitted Freemason and a fellow traveler. Glenn Campbell, George Knapp, who is also a Freemason. Colonel Philip Corso, a CIA operative who has just recently died. Richard Hoagland, the so-called alien autopsy film. The face on Mars, which is not there. The National Aeronautics and Space Administration. The so-called Mars media, meteorite, which supposedly contains fossil evidence of life on Mars, but does not at all contain any such evidence. The War of the Worlds, presented by the Mercury Theater on the Air, and many other people and events, are all projects of this type. Some, very few, however, of these people, are unwitting accomplices in the charade and truly believe in the extraterrestrial threat. Most of those whom I have just named, and many others not named, however, are active and with full knowledge, agents of Illuminism and Socialism. The most well-known are active fellow travelers. Communist agents of the KGB, the Central Intelligence Agency, are one of the many psychological warfare agencies founded by the Rhodes Roundtable Group, known as the Group, the Royal Institute of International Affairs, and the Council on Foreign Relations. The plan, ladies and gentlemen, to create an artificial alien threat to the Earth was first mentioned by the Marxist John Dewey, who is also the founder of our failing educational system. He said, quote, Someone remarked that the best way to unite all the nations on this globe would be an attack from some other planet. In the face of such an alien enemy, people would respond with a sense of their unity of interest and purpose. He said that, ladies and gentlemen, at a dinner in New York, in 1917. That's right. You heard it right, folks. 1917. The premise was tested for credibility with the CBS presentation of War of the Worlds by Orson Welles and the Mercury Theater on October 30th, 1938. The public believed the War of the Worlds was an actual news broadcast thus setting the stage for the implementation of an alien threat scenario. The only problem, ladies and gentlemen, was that the state of the art of technology at that time did not allow for a believable presentation. But the development of saucer-shaped wingless and tailless flying machines by the Germans during World War II, the implementation of psychological warfare against the sheeple of the world, and the continued development of secret technology under black projects classified and compartmentalized so that not even anyone in the Congress can ever know what it is that these people have solved the problem. President Ronald Reagan said this in a speech made to the 42nd General Assembly of the United Nations on September the 21st, 1987. And I quote, in our obsession with antagonisms of the moment, we often forget how much unites all the members of humanity. Perhaps we need some outside universal threat to make us realize this common bond. I occasionally think how quickly our differences would vanish if we were facing an alien threat from outside this world. He inserted that paragraph in eight speeches during his time as president. We obtained this CIA document through the Freedom of Information Act and through court battles. It's on Central Intelligence Agency letterhead, and it's from the office of the director. To the Director, Psychological Strategy Board, Subject Flying Saucers. One, I am today transmitting to the National Security Council a proposal, tab A, in which it is concluded that the problems connected with unidentified flying objects appear to have implications for psychological warfare as well as for intelligence and operations. Two, 
The background for this view is presented in some detail in tab B. 3. I suggest that we discuss at an early board meeting the possible offensive or defensive utilization of these phenomena for psychological warfare purposes. Signed, Walter B. Smith, Director. The announcement of the Jewish Holocaust, the proposal of a world government which would prevent future genocide or wars by the formation of a United Nations in 1945, and the announcement of sightings of flying saucers by Kenneth Arnold, an ex-intelligence officer, in 1947, launched the deception. The natural guilt harbored by the men of the 509th Atomic Bomb Wing, stationed just outside Roswell, New Mexico, after the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, made them eager conspirators in orchestrating the faked crash of an extraterrestrial craft and the discovery of shaved and surgically altered monkeys near Roswell, New Mexico. The artificial extraterrestrial threat was thus implanted in the minds of the public. And we recently obtained an FBI document through the Freedom of Information Act and through many court battles. From the FBI Dallas, Director and Senior Agent in Charge, Cincinnati, Flying Disc Information Concerning, and then it's blacked out, Headquarters, 8th Ed Air Force, telephonically advised this office that an object purporting to be a flying disc was recovered near Roswell, New Mexico this date. The disc is hexagonal in shape and was suspended from a balloon by cable, which balloon was approximately 20 feet in diameter. The next word or words are blacked out. Further advised that the object found resembles a high-altitude weather balloon with a radar reflector, but that telephonic conversation between their office and Wright Field had not, and the next two words are blacked out, Born this out. Born out this belief. Disc and balloon being transported to Wright Field by special plane for examination. Information provided this office because of national interest in case. And fact that National Broadcasting Company, Associated Press, and others attempting to break story of location of disc today. Two words blacked out. Advised would request Wright Field to advise Cincinnati office results of examination no further investigation being conducted. And then there are some further lines blacked out on the bottom. Ladies and gentlemen, applying Hitler's concept of the big lie, the artificial extraterrestrial threat was nurtured and built into an always present possibility over the next 50 years. Utilizing the psychological machine of the United States government and the intelligence community, and the partnership built between the Department of Defense and Hollywood during World War II. Eventually, a large percentage of the world's population found themselves believing in alien ships, extraterrestrial visitation, alien mutilation of animals, and alien abductions of humans with absolutely, and listen to me closely, absolutely no proof that extraterrestrials exist anywhere in the universe, much less that any have ever visited this planet. The artificial threat is further advanced through the mind control programming of Marxists and communists in Hollywood, radio, television, advertising, publishing houses, and the ufology movement, all of which are in the complete control of the Illuminati and the intelligence community. Fear is instilled through the incidental use of terror, inspired by the cattle and animal mutilation byproducts of the government's secret low-level radiation monitoring operations and the so-called alien abduction scenario induced by state-of-the-art and extremely sophisticated mind control operations. Wake up, America, you've been had. The research for tonight's broadcast was furnished by myself, William Cooper, and David Shedro. And uh, now, ladies and gentlemen, stay tuned for the original October 30th, 1938 broadcast of the War of the Worlds, which started it all in its entirety.
Community Broadcasting System and its affiliated stations present Orson Welles and the Mercury Theater on the Air in The War of the Worlds by H.G. West. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the director of the Mercury Theater and star of these broadcasts, Orson Welles. We know now that in the early years of the 20th century, this world was being watched closely by intelligences greater than man's, and yet as mortal as his own. We know now that as human beings busied themselves about their various concerns, they were scrutinized and studied. Perhaps almost as narrowly as a man with a microscope might scrutinize the transient creatures that swarm and multiply in a drop of water. With infinite complacence, people went to and fro over the earth about their little affairs, serene in the assurance of their dominion over this small, spinning fragment of solar driftwood, which by chance or design, man has inherited out of the dark mystery of time and space. Yet across an immense ethereal gulf, minds that are to our minds as ours are to the beasts in the jungle, intellects vast, cool, and unsympathetic, regarded this earth with envious eyes and slowly and surely drew their plans against us. In the 39th year of the 20th century came the great disillusionment. Near the end of October, Business was better. The war scare was over. More men were back at work. Sales were picking up. On this particular evening, October 30th, the Crosley Service estimated that 32 million people were listening in on radios. Next 24 hours, not much change in temperature. A slight atmospheric disturbance of undetermined origin is reported over Nova Scotia, causing a low-pressure area to move down rather rapidly over the northeastern states, bringing a forecast of rain accompanied by winds of light gale force. Maximum temperature 66, minimum 48. This weather report comes to you from the Government Weather Bureau. We take you now to the Meridian Room in the Hotel Park Plaza in downtown New York, where you will be entertained by the music of Raymond Raquello and his orchestra. Ladies and gentlemen, from the Meridian Room in the Park Plaza Hotel in New York City, we bring you the music of Raymond Raquello and his orchestra. With a touch of the Spanish, Raymond Raquello leads off with La Campesita. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we interrupt our program of dance music to bring you a special bulletin from the Intercontinental Radio News. At 20 minutes before 8 central time, Professor Farrell of the Mount Jennings Observatory, Chicago, Illinois, reports observing several explosions of incandescent gas occurring at regular intervals on the planet Mars. The spectroscope indicates the gas to be hydrogen and moving toward the Earth with enormous velocity. Professor Pearson of the observatory at Princeton confirms Farrell's observation and describes the phenomenon as, quote, like a jet of blue flame shot from a gun, unquote. We now return you to the music of Ramon Raquello, playing for you in the Meridian Room of the Park Plaza Hotel, situated in downtown New York. that never loses favor, the ever-popular Stardust, Damon Raquello and his orchestra.
Ladies and gentlemen, following on the news given in our bulletin a moment ago, the Government Meteorological Bureau has requested the large observatories of the country to keep an astronomical watch on any further disturbances occurring on the planet Mars. Due to the unusual nature of this occurrence, we have arranged an interview with a noted astronomer, Professor Pearson, who will give us his views on this event. In a few moments, we will take you to the Princeton Observatory at Princeton, New Jersey. We return you until then to the music of Ramon Raquello and his orchestra. Ready now to take you to the Princeton Observatory at Princeton, where Carl Phillips, our commentator, will interview Professor Richard Pearson, famous astronomer. We take you now to Princeton, New Jersey. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is Carl Phillips speaking to you from the observatory at Princeton. I'm, I'm standing in a large semicircular room, pitch black except for an oblong spread in the ceiling. Through this opening, I can see a sprinkling of stars that cast a kind of frosty glow over the intricate mechanism of the huge telescope. The ticking sound you hear is the vibration of the clockwork. Professor Pearson stands directly above me on a small platform, peering through the giant lens. I ask you to be patient, ladies and gentlemen, during any delay that may arise during our interview. Besides the ceaseless watch of the heavens, Professor Pearson may be interrupted by telephone or other communication. During this period, he is in constant touch with the astronomical centers of the world. Professor, may I begin our questions? At any time, Mr. Cook. Professor, would you please tell our radio audience exactly what you see as you observe the planet Mars through your telescope? Nothing unusual at the moment, Mr. Phillips. A red disc swimming in a blue sea. Transverse stripes across the disc. Quite distinct now, because Mars happens to be at the point nearest the Earth, in opposition, as we call it. In your opinion, what do these transverse stripes signify, Professor Huh. Not canals, I can assure you, Mr. Phillips. Hey. Although that's the popular conjecture of those who imagine Mars to be inhabited. From a scientific viewpoint, the stripes are merely the result of atmospheric conditions peculiar to this planet. Then you're quite convinced, as a scientist, that living intelligence as we know it does not exist on Mars? I say the chances against it are a thousand to one. And yet, how do you account for these gas eruptions occurring on the surface of the planet at regular intervals? Phillips, I cannot account for it. Well, by the way, Professor, for the benefit of our listeners, how far is Mars from the Earth? Approximately 40 million miles. <laughs> well, that seems a safe enough distance. Uh, just a moment, ladies and gentlemen. Someone has just handed Professor Pearson a message. While he reads it, let me remind you that we, we are speaking to you from the observatory in Princeton, New Jersey, where we are interviewing the world-famous astronomer Professor Pearson. Uh, one moment, please. Professor Pearson has passed me a message which he has just received. Uh, Professor, may I read the message to the listening audience? Certainly, Mr. Brooks. Ladies and gentlemen, I shall read you a wire addressed to Professor Pearson from Dr. Gray of the Natural History Museum, New York. Quote, 9.15 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Seismograph registered shock of almost earthquake intensity occurring within a radius of 20 miles of Princeton. Please investigate. Signed, Lloyd Gray, Chief of Astronomical Division. Unquote. Professor Pearson, could this occurrence possibly have something to do with the disturbances observed on the planet Mars? Oh, hardly, Mr. Phillips. This is probably a meteorite of unusual size, and its arrival at this particular time is merely a coincidence. However, we shall conduct a search as soon as daylight permits. Thank you, Professor. Ladies and gentlemen, for the past ten minutes, we've been speaking to you from the observatory at Princeton, bringing you a special interview with Professor Pearson, noted astronomer. This is Carl Phillips speaking. We are returning you now to our New York studio. Ladies and gentlemen, here is the latest bulletin from the Intercontinental Radio News, Toronto, Canada. Professor Morris of Macmillan University reports observing a total of three explosions on the planet Mars between the hours of 7.45 p.m. and 9.20 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. This confirms earlier reports received from American observatories. Now nearer home comes a special bulletin from Trenton, New Jersey. It is reported that at 8.50 p.m. a huge flaming object, believed to be a meteorite, fell on a farm in the neighborhood of Grover's Mill, New Jersey, 22 miles from Trenton. The flash in the sky was visible within a radius of several hundred miles, and the noise of the impact was heard as far north as Elizabeth. We have dispatched a special mobile unit to the scene, and we'll have our commentator, Carl Phillips, 
give you a word picture of the scene as soon as he can reach there from Princeton. In the meantime, we take you to the Hotel Martinet in Brooklyn, where Bobby Millett and his orchestra are offering a program of dance music. We take you now to Grover's Mill, New Jersey. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Carl Phillips again, out at the Wilmot Farm, Grover's Mill, New Jersey. Professor Pearson and myself made the 11 miles in Princeton in 10 minutes. Well, I hardly know where to begin. I paint for your word picture of a strange scene before my eyes, but something out of a modern Arabian night. Well, I just got here. I haven't had a chance to look around yet. I guess that's it. Yes, I guess that's the thing directly in front of me. Half buried in a vast pit. Must have struck with terrific force. The ground is covered with splinters of a tree. It must have struck on its way down. But I can see the object itself doesn't look very much like a meteor. At least not the meteors I've seen. It looks more like a huge cylinder. Has a diameter of, um, um, what would you say, Professor Pearson? What's that? Uh, what would you say? Uh, what's the diameter of the... About 30 yards. About 30 yards. The metal on the sheath is... Well, I've never seen anything like it. The color is sort of yellowish-white. It's curious spectators now are pressing close to the object in spite of the efforts of the police to keep them back. Uh, getting in front of my line of... Uh, uh, would you mind standing one side, please? While the police are pushing the crowd back. Here's Mr. Wilmot, owner of the farm here. He may have some interesting facts to add. Mr. Wilmot, uh, would you please tell the radio audience as much as you remember of this rather unusual visitor that dropped in your backyard? Uh, a step closer, please. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Mr. Wilmot. <laughs> Well, I was listening to the radio. Close and louder, please. Pardon me? Uh, louder, please, close. Yes. <clears throat> I was listening to the radio and kind of drowsy. A professor fellow was talking about Mars, so I was half chosen and half... Yes, yes, Mr. Wilmot, and uh, then what happened? Well, as I was saying, I was listening to the radio kind of halfway... Yes, Mr. Wilmot, and then you saw something. Well, not first off. I heard something. And what did you hear? A uh, hissing sound like this... Uh, kind of like a 4th of July rocket. Yes, then what? I turned my head out the window and would have sworn I was asleep and dreaming. Yes. I seen a kind of greenish streak and then zingle. Something smacked the ground. Knocked me clear out of my chair. Well, were you frightened, Mr. Wilmot? Well, I ain't quite sure. I reckon I was kind of riled. <laughs> well, thank you, Mr. Wilmot. Thank you very much. Yeah, you want me to tell no, that's quite all right. That's plenty. Ladies and gentlemen, you've just heard Mr. Wilmot, owner of the farm, where this thing has fallen. I wish I could convey the atmosphere that background of this fantastic scene. Hundreds of cars are parked in a field in back of us, and the police are trying to rope off the roadway leading into the farm, but it's no use. They're breaking right through. The car's headlights throw an enormous spotlight on the pit where the objects have buried. Now, some of the more daring souls now are venturing near the edge. Yeah, they kill you and stand out against the metal field. <laughs> One man wants to touch the thing. He's having an argument with a policeman. Now, the policeman wins. Now, ladies and gentlemen, there's something I haven't mentioned in all this excitement, but... It's becoming more distinct. Perhaps you've caught it already on your radio. Listen, please. Do you hear it? The curious humming sound that seems to come from inside the object. I'll uh, move the microphone nearer. Here. Now, we're not more than 25 feet away. Uh, can you hear it now? Uh, Professor Pearson. Yes, Mr. Uh, can you tell us the meaning of that scraping noise inside the thing? Uh, possibly the unequal cooling of its surface. I say, do you still think it's a meteor, Professor? I don't know what to think. The uh, metal casing is definitely extraterrestrial. Uh, not found on this earth. Friction with the earth's atmosphere usually tears holes in a meteorite. This thing is smooth and... You can see it's cylindrical. Uh, something's happening. Ladies and gentlemen, this is terrific. This end of the thing is beginning to flake off. The top is beginning to rotate like a screw, and the thing must be hollow. He's moving! Look at that! He's back! 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 He's back!
turned out of that black hole two luminous discs. For the eyes, it might be a face, might be on the oh, oh, heavens. Something wriggling out of the shadow like a gray snake. Now it's another one, and another one, and another one. They look like tentacles to me. Oh, yeah, I can see the thing's body now. It's large, and it's large as a bear. It's crystal, it's like wet leather, but that face, it's, it's, ladies and gentlemen, it's indescribable. I can hardly force myself to keep looking at it. It's so awful. The eyes are black, and they gleam like a serpent in the mouth. It's, it's kind of V-shaped, where it's alive. It's dripping from its rimless lips. It seems to... Oh, quiver and pulsate and the monster or whatever it is can hardly move it seems weighed down by uh, possibly gravity or something the thing's rising up now and the cloud falls back it seems plenty of course it's not very experienced ladies and gentlemen I can't find words and, well I'll pull this microphone with me if they talk I'll have to stop the description so I can take a new position hold on will you please I'll be right back in a minute bringing you an eyewitness account of what's happening on the Wilmot Farm, Groversville, New Jersey. We now return you to Carl Phillips at Grover's Mill. Ladies and gentlemen, my aunt. Ladies and gentlemen. Ladies and gentlemen, here I am, back of a stone wall that joins this Wilmot's garden. From here, I get a sweep of the whole scene. I'll give you every detail as long as I can talk and as long as I can see. More state police have arrived. They're drawing up a cordon in front of the pit. About 30 of them. No need to push the crowd back now. They're willing to keep their distance. The captain conferring with someone. Can't quite see who. Oh, yes, I believe it's Professor Pearson. Yes, it is. Now, now they've parted and the professor moves around one side, studying the object while the captain and two policemen advance with something in their hands. I can see it now. It's a white handkerchief tied to a pole. Flag of truce. Those creatures know what that means. What anything means. Wait a minute. Something's happening. Some shape is rising out of the pit. And it make out a small beam of light against the mirror. The pet. There's a jet of flame swinging in the mirror and at least right at the advancing men. It strikes them head on. Lord, they're turning into flames. The whole field by the woods of the They're dead tanks, tanks with the automobiles spreading everywhere. Coming this way now, about 20 yards to my right. Ladies and gentlemen, due to circumstances beyond our control, we are unable to continue the broadcast from Grover's Mill. Evidently, there is some difficulty with our field transmission. However, we will return to that point at the earliest opportunity. In the meantime, we have a late bulletin from San Diego, California. Professor Endelkoffer, speaking at a dinner of the California Astronomical Society, expressed the opinion that the explosions on Mars are undoubtedly nothing more than severe volcanic disturbances on the surface of the planet. We continue now with our piano interlude. Ladies and gentlemen, I've just been handed a message that came in from Grover's Mill by telephone. Just one moment, please. At least 40 people, including six state troopers, lie dead in a field east of the village of Grover's Mill. Their bodies burned and distorted beyond all possible recognition. The next voice you hear will be that of Brigadier General Montgomery Smith, commander of the state militia at Trenton, New Jersey. I have been requested by the governor of New Jersey to place the counties of Mercer and Middlesex as as far west as Princeton and uh, east to Jamesburg under martial law. No one will be permitted to enter this area except by special pass issued by state or military authorities. Four companies of state militia are proceeding from Trenton to Grover's Mill and uh, will aid in the evacuation of homes within the range of military operations. Thank you. You have just been listening to General Montgomery Smith, commanding the state militia at Trenton. In the meantime, further details of the catastrophe at Grover's Mill are coming in. The strange creatures, after unleashing their deadly assault, crawled back in their pit and made no attempt to prevent the efforts of the firemen to recover the bodies and extinguish the fire. The combined fire departments of Mercer County are fighting the flames which menace the entire countryside. We have been unable to establish any contact with our mobile unit at Grover's Mill. But we hope to be able to return you there at the earliest possible moment. In the meantime, we take you to... Just one moment, please. 
Ladies and gentlemen, I have just been informed that we have finally established communication with an eyewitness of the tragedy. Professor Pearson has been located at a farmhouse near Grover's Mill, where he has established an emergency observation post. As a scientist, he will give you his explanation of the calamity. The next voice you hear will be that of Professor Pearson, brought to you by Direct Wire. Professor Pearson. Of the creatures in the rocket cylinder at Grover's Mill, I can give you no authoritative information, either as to their nature, their origin, or their purposes here on Earth. Of their destructive instrument, I might venture some conjectural explanation. For want of a better term, I shall refer to the mysterious weapon as a heat ray. It's all too evident that these creatures have scientific knowledge far in advance of our own. It's my guess that in some way they are able to generate an intense heat in a chamber of practically absolute non-conductivity. This intense heat they project in a parallel beam against any object they choose by means of a polished parabolic mirror of unknown composition, much as the mirror of a lighthouse projects a beam of light. Uh, that is my conjecture of the origin of the heat ray. Thank you, Professor Pearson. Ladies and gentlemen, here is a bulletin from Trenton. It is a brief statement informing us that the charred body of Carl Phillips has been identified in the Trenton Hospital. Now, here's another bulletin from Washington, D.C. The office of the director of the National Red Cross reports ten units of Red Cross emergency workers have been assigned to the headquarters of the state militia, stationed outside of Grover's Mill, New Jersey. Here's a bulletin from State Police, Princeton Junction. The fires at Grover's Mill and vicinity are now under control. Scouts report all quiet in the pit, and there is no sign of life appearing from the mouth of the cylinder. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we have a special statement from Mr. Harry McDonald, Vice President in charge of operations. We have received a request from the State Militia of Trenton to place at their disposal our entire broadcasting facilities. In view of the gravity of the situation, and believing that radio has a responsibility to serve in the public interest at all times, we are turning over our facilities to the State Militia at Trenton. We take you now to the field headquarters of the state militia near Grover's Mill, New Jersey. This is Captain Lansing of the Signal Corps attached to the state militia, now engaged in military operations in the vicinity of Grover's Mill. Situation arising from the reported presence of certain individuals of unidentified nature is now under complete control. The cylindrical object, which lies in a pit directly below our position, surrounded on all sides by eight battalions of infantry. Without heavy field pieces, but adequately armed with rifles and machine guns. All cause for alarm, if such cause ever existed, is now entirely unjustified. Things, whatever they are, do not even venture to poke their heads above the pit. I can see their hiding place plainly in the glare of the searchlights here. With all their reported resources, these creatures can scarcely stand up against heavy machine gun fire. Anyway, it's an interesting outing for the troops. I can make out their copy uniforms crossing back and forth in front of the lights. Looks almost like a real war. There appears to be some slight smoke in the woods bordering the Millstone River. Probably fire started by campers. Well, uh, we ought to see some action soon. One of the companies is deploying on the left flank. A quick thrust and it'll all be over. Now, wait a minute. I see something on top of the cylinder. No, no, it's nothing but a shadow. Now the troops are on the edge of the Wilmot Farm. 7,000 armed men closing in on an old metal tube. A tub, rather. Well, wait, that wasn't a shadow. It's something moving. Solid metal. Kind of a shield-like affair rising up out of the cylinder. It's going higher and higher. But it's, it's standing on legs. Actually rearing up on a sort of metal framework. Now it's reaching above the trees and the searchlights are on it. Hold on. Ladies and gentlemen, I have a grave announcement to make. Incredible as it may seem, both the observations of science and the evidence of our eyes lead to the inescapable assumption that those strange beings who landed in the Jersey farmlands tonight are the vanguard of an invading army from the planet Mars. The battle which took place tonight at Grover Mills has ended in one of the most startling defeats ever suffered by an army in modern times. 7,000 men armed with rifles and machine guns pitted against a single fighting machine of the invaders from Mars. 120 known survivors. The rest strewn over the battle area from Grover's Mill to Plainsboro, crushed and trampled to death under the metal feet of the monster, or burned to cinders by its heat ray. 
The monster is now in control of the middle section of New Jersey and has effectively cut the state through its center. Communication lines are down from Pennsylvania to the Atlantic Ocean. Railroad tracks are torn and service from New York to Philadelphia discontinued except routing some of the trains through Allerton and Phoenixville. Highways to the north, south, and west are clogged with frantic human traffic. Police and army reserves are unable to control the mad flight. By morning, the fugitives will have swelled Philadelphia, Camden, and Trenton. It is estimated to twice their normal population. Martial law prevails throughout New Jersey and eastern Pennsylvania. At this time, we take you to Washington for a special broadcast on the national emergency. The Secretary of the Interior. Citizens of the nation, I shall not try to conceal the gravity of the situation that confronts the country, nor the concern of your government in protecting the lives and property of its people. However, I wish to impress upon you private citizens and public officials, all of you, the urgent need of calm and resourceful action. Fortunately, this formidable enemy is still confined to a comparatively small area, and we may place our faith in the military forces to keep them there. In the meantime, placing our faith in God we must continue the performance of our duties, each and every one of us, so that we may confront this destructive adversary with a nation united, courageous, and consecrated to the preservation of human supremacy on this earth. I thank you. You have just heard the Secretary of the Interior speaking from Washington. Bulletins too numerous to read are piling up in the studio here. We are informed that the central portion of New Jersey is blacked out from radio communication due to the effect of the heat ray upon power lines and electrical equipment. Here is a special bullet in New York. Cables have been received from English, French, and German scientific bodies offering assistance. Astronomers report continued gas outbursts at regular intervals on the planet Mars. The majority voiced the opinion that the enemy will be reinforced by additional rocket machines. There have been several attempts made to locate Professor Pearson of Princeton, who has observed Martians at close range. It is feared he was lost in the recent battle. Langham Field, Virginia. Scouting planes report three Martian machines visible above treetops, moving north toward Somerville with population fleeing ahead of them. The heat ray is not in use, although advancing at express train speed, invaders pick their way carefully. They seem to be making a conscious effort to avoid destruction of cities and countryside. However, they stop to uproot power lines, bridges, and railroad tracks. Their apparent objective is to crush resistance, paralyze communication, and disorganize human society. Here is a bulletin from Basking Ridge, New Jersey. Coon hunters have stumbled on a second cylinder similar to the first, embedded in the Great Swamp 20 miles south of Morristown. Army field pieces are proceeding from Newark to blow up the second invading unit before the cylinder can be opened from the fighting machine rig. They are taking up a position in the foothills of Washington Mountains. Another, another, another bulletin from Langham Field, Virginia. Scouting planes report enemy machines now three in number, increasing speed northward, ticking over houses and trees in their evident haste to form a conjunction with their allies south of Marstown. Machines also started by telephone operator east of Middlesex within ten miles of Plainfield. Here's a bulletin from Winston Field, Long Island. A fleet of army bombers carrying heavy explosives flying north in pursuit of enemy. Scouting planes act as guides. They keep the speeding enemy in sight. Just a moment, please, ladies and gentlemen. We've, uh, we've run special wires to the artillery line in adjacent villages to give you direct reports from the zone of the advancing enemy. First, we take you to the battery of the 22nd Field Artillery, located in the Washington Mountains. Range 32 meters. 32 meters. Protection 39 degrees. 39 degrees. Fire! Fire! 40 yards to the right, sir. Ship range, 31 meters. 31 meters. Protection, 37 degrees. 37 degrees. Fire. Hit that. What's the type of one of them? They stopped. The others are trying to repair. Quick, get the range. Ship, 50, 30 meters. 30 meters. Protection, 27 degrees. 27 degrees. Fire! I see the fair lamp, sir. Letting off the smoke. What is it? Black smoke, sir. Moving this way. 
Right, close to the ground. Moving fast. Put on gas, Matt. The 30 to file. Hit the 24 meters. 24 meters. Protection, 24 degrees. 24 degrees. Fire. <laughs> There can be, sir. Smoke's coming nearer. Get the range. There can be. Meters. 23 meters. 23 meters. Army bombing plane BK-43 off Bayonne, New Jersey. Lieutenant Roach commanding eight bombers. Reporting to Commander Fairfax Langham Field. This is Roach reporting to Commander Fairfax Langham Field. Enemy tripod machines now in sight. Reinforced by three machines from the Marstown Cylinder. Six all together. One machine partially crippled. Believed hit by shell from Army gun in Wachung Mountains. Guns now appear silent. A heavy black fog hanging close to the earth of extreme density, nature unknown. No sign of heat ray. Enemy now turns east, crossing Passaic River into the Jersey marshes. Another straddles the Pulaski Skyway. Evident objective is New York City. They're pushing down a high-tension power station. Machines are close together now, and we're ready to attack. Plane circling, ready to strike. A thousand yards and we'll be over the first. Eight hundred yards. Six hundred. Four hundred. 200. There they go. The giant arm rays. Green flash. This spraying us with flame. 2,000 feet. Engines are giving out. No chance to release bombs. Only one thing left. Drop on them. Plane and all. We're diving on the first one. The gone. This is Bayonne, New Jersey, calling Langham Field. This is Bayonne, New Jersey, calling Langham Field. Come in, please. This is Langham Field. Go ahead. Eight Army bombers in engagement with enemy tripod machines over Jersey Flats. Engines incapacitated by heat ray. All crashed. One enemy machine destroyed. Enemy now discharging heavy black smoke in direction of... This is Newark, New Jersey. This is Newark, New Jersey. Warning. Poisonous black smoke pouring in from Jersey marshes. Reaches South Street. Gas masks useless. Urge population to move into open spaces. Automobiles use routes 7, 23, 24. Avoid congested areas. Smoke now spreading over, over Raymond Boulevard... Two X to L calling C Q. Two X to L calling C Q. Two X to L calling eight X three R. Come in, please. This is eight X three R coming back at two X two L. Our reception. Our reception. Hey, please. Where are you, eight X three R? What's the matter? Where are you? Broadcasting building. I'm speaking from the roof of Broadcasting Building, New York City. The bells you hear are ringing to warn the people to evacuate the city as Martians approach. Estimated in the last two hours, three million people have moved out along the roads to the north. Hutchison River Parkway is still kept open for motor traffic. Boyd bridges to Long Island, hopelessly jammed. 
All communication with Jersey Shore closed ten minutes ago. No more defenses. Our army is wiped out. Artillery, Air Force, everything wiped out. This may be the last broadcast. We'll stay here to the end. People are holding service here below us in the cathedral. Now I look down the harbor, all, all manner of boats, overloaded with clean population, pulling out from docks. Streets are all jammed, noise and crowds like New Year's Eve in city. Wait a minute, the, the enemy is now in sight above the Palisades. Five, five great machines. First one is crossing the river. I can see it from here, waiting, waiting the Hudson like a man waiting through a brook. A bulletin is handed me. Martian cylinders are falling all over the country. One outside of Buffalo, one in Chicago, St. Louis. Seem to be time and space. Now the first machine reaches the shore. He stands watching, looking over the city. Steel cowlish head is even with his skyscrapers. He waits for the others. They rise like a line of new towers on the city's west side. Now they're lifting their metal hands. This is the end now. Smoke comes out, black smoke drifting over the city. People in the street see it now. They're running toward the East River, thousands of them, dropping in like rats. Now the smoke's spreading faster. It reaches Times Square. People are trying to run away from it, but it's no use. They, they're falling like flies. Now the smoke's crossing 6th Avenue. 5th Avenue. A uh, hundred yards away. It's... It's 50 feet. Two X two L calling CQ. Two X two L calling CQ New York. Isn't there anyone on the air? Isn't there anyone on the air? Isn't there anyone? Two X two L. You are listening to a CBS presentation of Orson Welles and the Mercury Theatre on the Air in an original dramatization of The War of the Worlds by H.G. Wells. The performance will continue after a brief intermission. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. The War of the Worlds by H.G. Wells, starring Orson Welles and the Mercury Theatre on the Air. set down these notes on paper. I am obsessed by the thought that I may be the last living man on earth. I've been hiding in this empty house near Grover's Mill, a small island of daylight cut off by the black smoke from the rest of the world. All that happened before the arrival of these monstrous creatures in the world now seems part of another life. A life that has no continuity with the present furtive existence of the lonely derelict who pencils these words on the back of some astronomical notes bearing the signature of Richard Pearson. 
Look down at my blackened hands. And I try to connect them with a professor who lives at Princeton and who on the night of October 20th glimpsed through his telescope an orange splash of light on a distant planet. My wife, my colleagues, my students, my books, my observatory, my... My world, where are they? Did they ever exist? Am I Richard Pearson? What day is it? Do days exist without calendars? Does time pass when there are no human hands left to wind the clocks? Writing down my daily life, I tell myself I shall preserve human history between the dark covers of this little book that was meant to record the movements of the stars. But to write, I must live, and to live, I must eat. Find moldy bread in the kitchen and an orange not too spoiled to swallow. Keep watch at the window. Time to time, I catch sight of a Martian above the black smoke. Smoke still holds the house in its black coil, but at length there's a hissing sound, and suddenly I see a Martian mounted on his machine, spraying the air with a jet of steam as if to dissipate the smoke. I watch in a corner as his huge metal legs nearly brush against the house. Exhausted by terror, I fall asleep. Morning. Morning. Sun streams in the window. Black cloud of gas is lifted, and the scorched meadows to the north look as though a black snowstorm had passed over. I venture from the house. I make my way to a road. No traffic. Here in a wrecked car, baggage overturned, a blackened skeleton. Push on north. For some reason, I feel safer trailing these monsters than running away from them. And I keep a careful watch. I've seen the Martians feed. Should one of their machines appear over the top of trees, I'm ready to fling myself flat on the earth. I come to a chestnut tree. October. Chestnuts are ripe. Go my pockets. I just keep a line. Two days I wander in a vague northerly direction through a desolate world. Finally, I notice a living creature. A small red squirrel in a beech tree. I stare at him and wonder. He stares back at me. I believe at that moment the animal and I shared the same emotion. The joy of finding another living being. Push on north. I find dead cows in a brackish field and beyond the charred ruins of a dairy the silo made standing guard over the wasteland like a lighthouse deserted by the sea. Stride the silo, purchase a weathercock, the arrow points north. North. Next day I come to a city. A city vaguely familiar in its contours, yet its buildings strangely dwarfed and leveled off as if of a giant that spliced off its highest towers with a capricious sweep of his hand. Reached the outskirts and found Newark. Newark, undemolished but humbled by some whim of the advancing Martians. Presently, with an odd feeling of being watched, I caught sight of something crouching in a doorway. I mean, a step towards it. It rose up and became a man. Man armed with a large knife. Stop. Where do you come from? Oh, I come from from many places. A long time ago, from Princeton. Princeton, huh? That's near Grover's Mill. Yes. Grover's Mill. <laughs> There's no food here. This is my country. All this end of town down the river. There's only food for one. Which way are you going? I don't know. I guess I'm looking for people. Hey, what was that? Did you hear something just then? No. Only a bird. A live bird. Uh, you get to know that birds have shadows these days. 
Say, we're in the open here. Let's crawl in this doorway here and talk. Have you seen any Martians? No. They've gone over to New York. Night, the sky is alive with their lights, just as if people were still living in it. By daylight, you can't see them. Five days ago, a couple of them carried something big across the flats from the airport. I think they're learning how to fly. Fly? Yeah, fly. Hmm. Well, it's all over with humanity. Stranger, there's still you and I. Two of us left. Yeah. They got themselves in solid. They wrecked the greatest country in the world. Those green stars, they're probably falling somewhere every night. They've only lost one machine. There isn't anything to do. We're done. We're licked. Where were you? You're in a uniform. Yeah, what's left of it. I was in the militia. National Guard. <laughs> That's good. There wasn't any war. Any more than there's war between men and ants. Yes, but we're eatable ants. I found that out. What will they do to us? I thought it all out. Right now, we're caught as we're wanted. The Martian only had to go a few miles to get a crowd on the run. But they won't keep on doing that. They'll begin catching us systematically, like keeping the best and storing us in cages and things. They haven't begun on us yet. Not begun? Not begun. All that's happened so far is because we don't have sense enough to keep quiet. Bothering them with guns and such stuff and losing our heads and rushing off in crowds. Ah, oh, instead of our rushing around blind, we've got to fix ourselves up. Fix ourselves up according to the way things are now. Cities, nations, civilization, progress. Yes, but if that's so, what is there to live for? Well, there won't be any more concerts for a million years or so and no nice little dinners at restaurants. If it's amusement you're after, I guess the game's up. What if they left? Life, that's what. I want to live. Yeah, and so do you. We're not going to be exterminated. And I don't mean to be caught either. Tamed and fattened and bred like an ox. What are you going to do? I'm going on. Right under their feet. I got a plan. We men as men, we're finished. We don't know enough. We've got to learn plenty before we get a chance. We've got to live and keep free what we learn, see? I've thought it all out, see? I'll tell you the rest. Well, it isn't all of us that are made for wild beasts. That's what it got to, that, that's what it got to be. That's why I watched you. Watched you. All those little office workers that used to live in these houses, they'd be no good. They haven't any stuff in them. They used to run. Run off to work. I've seen hundreds of them running to catch their commuter's train in the morning. Afraid they could can if they didn't. Running back at night. Afraid they wouldn't be in time for dinner. Lives insured and a little invested in case of accidents. And on Sundays, worried about the hereafter. Well, the Martians, they'll be a godsend for those guys. Nice roomy cages. Good food. Careful breeding. No worries. Yeah, after a week or so of chasing around the fields on empty stomachs, they'll come and be glad to be caught. You've thought it all out, haven't you? Sure, you bet I have. That isn't all. These Martians are going to make pets of them. Train them to do tricks. Who knows, get sentimental over the pet boy who grew up and had to be killed. Yeah, and some maybe. They're trained to hunt us. Oh, no, it's impossible. It's human. Yes, they will. There's men who do it gladly. One of them ever comes after me by... In the meantime, you and I and others like us, where are we to live when the Martians own the earth? I got it all figured out. We'll live underground. I've been thinking about the sewers. Under New York, there are miles and miles of them. The main ones, they're big enough for anybody. And there's cellars, vaults, underground storerooms, railway tunnels, subways. You begin to see, huh? We've got a bunch of strong men together. No weak ones. That rubbish, out. As you made me to go. All right. Give you a chance, didn't you? I won't quarrel about that. Go on. Well, we've got to make safe places for us to stay in, see? Get all the books we can. Science books. That's where men like you come in, see? We raid the museums. We'll even spy on the Martians. May not be so much we have to learn before... Just imagine this. Four or five of their own fighting machines suddenly start off. 
Heat rays right and left. Not a Martian in them. Not a Martian in them, see? But men. Men who've learned the way how. Maybe even in our time. Gee. Imagine having one of them lovely things with a heat ray wide and free. We turn it on Martians. We turn it on men. We bring everybody down on their knees. That's your plan. Yeah. You. Me. Marks. We don't the world. I think. Hey. Hey, what's the matter? Where are you going? Not to your world. Bye, stranger. Well, after parting with the artillerymen, I came at last to the Holland Tunnel, entered that silent tube. Anxious to know the fate of the great city on the other side of the Hudson. Cautiously, I came out of the tunnel and made my way up Canal Street. Reached 14th Street, and there again were black powder and several bodies and an evil, ominous smell from the gratings of the cellars of some of the houses. I wandered up through the 30s and 40s, stood alone on Times Square, caught sight of a lean dog running down 7th Avenue with a piece of dark brown meat in his jaws and a pack of starving mongrels at his heels. Made a wide circle around me as though he feared I might prove a fresh competitor. Walked up Broadway in the direction of that... that strange powder, that silent shop windows, displaying their mute wares to empty sidewalks. That's the Capitol Theater. Silent. Dark. That's the shooting gallery where a row of empty guns faced an arrested line of wooden ducks near Columbus Circle... I noticed models of 1939 motor cars in the showrooms facing empty streets. Over the top of the General Motors building, I watched a flock of black birds circling in the sky. Hurried on. Suddenly, I caught sight of the hood of a Martian machine, standing somewhere in Central Park, gleaming in the late afternoon sun. And same idea, I... I, I rushed recklessly across Columbus Circle and into the park. I, I climbed a small hill above the pond at 60th Street and... From there, I could see standing in a silent row along the mall, 19 of those great metal titans, their cowls empty, their steel arms hanging listlessly by their sides. I looked in vain for the monsters that inhabit those machines. Suddenly, my eyes were attracted to the immense flock of black birds that hovered directly below me. They circled to the ground. And there before my eyes, stark and silent, Play the Martians with the hungry birds pecking and tearing brown shreds of flesh from their dead bodies. Later, when their bodies were examined in laboratories, it was found that they were killed by the putrefactive and diseased bacteria against which their systems were unprepared. Slain, after all, man's defenses had failed by the humblest thing that God, as wisdom, has put upon this earth. Before the cylinder fell, there was a general persuasion that through all the deep of space, no life existed beyond the petty surface of our minute sphere. Now we see further, dim and wonderful is the vision I've conjured up in my mind of life spreading slowly from this little seedbed of the solar system throughout the inanimate vastnesses of sidereal space, but it's a remote dream. Maybe, maybe that the destruction of the Martians is only a reprieve to them and not to us. It's the future ordained for us. How strange it now seems to sit in my peaceful study, Princeton, writing down this last chapter of the record, begun at a deserted farm in Grover's Mill. Strange to watch children playing in the streets. Strange to see young people strolling on the green where the new spring grass heals the last black scars of a bruised earth. Strange to watch the sightseers enter the museum where the dissembled parts of a Martian machine are kept on public view. Strange when I recall the time when I first saw it. Bright and clean cut, hard and silent. Under the dawn of that last great day.
This is Orson Welles, ladies and gentlemen. Out of character, to assure you that the War of the Worlds has no further significance than as the holiday offering it was intended to be. The Mercury Theater's own radio version of dressing up in a sheet and jumping out of a bush and saying boo. Starting now, we couldn't soap all your windows and steal all your garden gates by tomorrow night, so we did the best next thing. We annihilated the world before your very ears and utterly destroyed the CBS. You will be relieved, I hope, to learn that we didn't mean it and that both institutions are still open for business. So goodbye, everybody, and remember, please, for the next day or so, the terrible lesson you learned tonight. That grinning, glowing, globular invader of your living room is an inhabitant of the pumpkin patch, and if your doorbell rings and nobody's there, that was no Martian. It's Halloween. <laughs> Tonight, the Columbia Broadcasting System and its affiliated stations, Coast to Coast, has brought you The War of the World by H.G. Wells, the 17th in its weekly series of dramatic broadcasts featuring Orson Welles and the Mercury Theater on the air. Next week, we present a dramatization of three famous short stories. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. Stay tuned, ladies and gentlemen, for a biography of Orson Welles, followed by the 1978 musical version of War of the Worlds. What a great night for this, huh? <laughs>